Hello, and welcome to my talk. Today I'm going to talk a bit about a relationship between the transverse geometry of top foliations and left orderings of fundamental groups of three manifolds. Now, the study of top foliations and left orderings goes back to work of Thurston and Caligari and Dunfield in the late 90s, but there has been renewed interest in recent years due to the L-space conjecture popularized by Boyer, Gordon, and Watson. The conjecture says that three conditions on an irreducible oriented rational homology sphere are equivalent. First, the condition that M supports a top foliation. Second, the condition that pi 1 of M is left orderable. And third, that M is not a Hagard Fleur L space. I'll review the definitions of these conditions in a moment, but for now it suffices to say that the first condition is a purely topological condition, native to three dimensional topology. The second is purely group theoretic, relating us to the theory of the dynamics of group actions on one manifolds, and the third comes from Fleur theory and gauge theory in four manifolds. So the conjecture holds the promise of relating these seemingly disparate fields, but we're still lacking in good conceptual reasons for why the conjecture should hold true. What is known about the conjecture? Well, first, we know that top foliation implies non-L space. This piece passes through a connection between top foliations and context structures, and subsequently four-dimensional symplectic topology. Second, Thurston proved that a top foliation gives rise to an action on a circle. This is promising, but it's strictly weaker than acting on a line. There's a homological obstruction to lifting an action on a circle to an action on a line. Third, we know that it's true for all graph manifolds. So we know this essentially by a complete classification of the manifolds satisfying each of these three conditions. Next, we know many examples of intervals of Dane surgeries on knots and links for which some or all of these conditions coincide. And last, Dunfield has been searching for a counterexample among small hyperbolic manifolds and has now built up a rather impressive corpus of computational evidence for the conjecture. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the implication top foliation implies left or above. In a moment, I'll go over some more precise definitions, but let me begin with a quick preview of the strategy I'll be taking for those of you who are already comfortable with definitions. So let M be an oriented irreducible three manifold and F a co-orientable top foliation on M. Everything in sight today is going to be oriented and co-oriented, so I'll probably stop saying so explicitly. We can lift the foliation to the universal cover and construct the leaf space, L, which I define to be the universal cover modulo the lift of the foliation to the universal cover. So in other words, the space of leaves of the foliation and the universal cover. Let me draw an example one dimension down of a foliation on a torus. I'm drawing the torus like a cylinder with top and bottom identified. Now let me put a foliation on this torus. The foliation will have two compact, sorry, one compact leaf, the blue circle that you see. The remaining leaves will spiral around. Though in one direction they limit towards the top, and in the other direction they limit towards the bottom. In the universal cover, we see an integer's worth of lifts of the blue compact leaf and the remaining leaves are shaped like this. In this case, the foliation on the universal cover is topologically equivalent to the standard foliation R2 cross R. So the leaf space, M tilde modulo F tilde, is a real line with an integer's worth of lifts of the blue circle. In this case, the leaf space is homeomorphic to R. When this is true, we say that the foliation is R covered. And whenever this is the case, pi one of M is left orderable because we have an action of pi one of M on the universal cover, which descends to an action on the leaf space. In this case, you can convince yourself that the action of the vertical generator of T2 acts on the leaf space by translation by one unit. And the action of the horizontal generator on the leaf space is by a map which fixes 
all of the blue points and sort of smudges the remaining points downwards. In the generic case, L is more complicated. Think some kind of infinite tree. To be more precise, it's a simply connected, but possibly non-Hausdorff one manifold. We'll try to define an equivalence relation on L, such that L modulo this equivalence relation is R, and such that the action of pi 1 on, of M on L descends to an action on the quotient. Okay, now in this talk, I hope to show you that this idea is not hopelessly optimistic, and it actually applies to a large class of foliations built from pseudo nosov flows. Okay, let's take a step back now and go through some basic definitions. Here are two definitions of left orderability. First, a group is left orderable if it can be presented as a group of orientation-preserving homeomorphisms of R. Alternatively, it is left orderable if it can be decomposed into three sets, P for positive, a singleton containing the identity, and N for negative, and we ask that positive times positive is positive, and negative times negative is negative. There's no constraint on positive times negative. This implies, for example, that if X is in P, then x inverse must be in n, because x times x inverse is not in p. We call p and n the positive and negative cones, since thinking of group operation additively, they're closed under addition and non-negative scaling. The two definitions are equivalent for counter groups. I won't prove that for you right now. Here's a very useful theorem of Boyer, Wolfson, and Wiest, which says that if we restrict to three manifold groups, we can drop the condition of faithfulness of the action on R in the definition of left orderability. Okay, let's look at some simple examples of left orderable and non left orderable groups. First of all, z plus z is left orderable. We can draw z plus z as a lattice. Now, to construct a left ordering, we'll choose a line of irrational slope and declare everything on one side to be the positive cone and everything on the other side to be the negative cone. Now clearly positive plus positive is positive and negative plus negative is negative. More generally, pi one of an oriented surface of a genus G is left orderable. Here's another example that's useful in practice. The universal cover of PSL2R is left orderable. Why is that? Well, PSL2R acts on H2 and it also acts on the boundary of H2 at infinity. The universal cover of PSL2R acts on the universal cover of S1. So it acts on R and is left orderable. Let's look at some examples of groups that are not left orderable. First of all, any group with torsion is not left orderable. For example, let's say that G is a group with torsion, and say A cubed is the identity. Without loss of generality, let's say that a is in the positive cone. Well, that implies that a squared would have to be in the positive cone. And that implies that a cubed would be in the positive cone, which means that the identity is in the positive cone, which violates the condition of being left orderable. Here's a slightly more complicated example, a two-generator, two-relator group. Now, there's nothing really special about the presentation I wrote down, except for the fact that the first relator contains only positive exponents of A and B, and the second relator contains negative exponents of A and positive exponents of B. The other condition I need is that A and B are non-trivial in the group. Well, suppose this group were left orderable. Suppose further that A is in the positive cone and B is in the positive cone. Well, in this case, that would imply that relator 1 is in the positive cone. And we can't have that because relator 1 is equal to the identity. On the other hand, suppose that A is in the negative cone and B is in the positive cone. That implies that A inverse is in the positive cone, which implies that relator 2 is in the positive cone. This also violates left orderability because relator 2 is equal to the identity. The other two cases are similar, so this group can't be left orderable.
Now, if a group is not left orderable, there is always a combinatorial proof of that fact, like the ones I just gave. On the other hand, it's often hard to show that a group is left orderable. The condition is not decidable in general, and usually to prove a group is left orderable, you just need to exhibit an action. To survey the available range of techniques, let's specialize to the case of surgeries on the figure eight knot. This is a case where today's techniques are especially well adapted. The L-space conjecture predicts that every non-trivial surgery has a left orderable fundamental group. First, there's a very successful representation theoretic strategy for producing left orders. The universal cover of PSL2R is left orderable, as we just noted. So as long as a homological lifting obstruction vanishes, you can produce left orders from PSL2R representations. There's a deformation theory for such representations that works in the range minus four to four. The minus four and plus four surgeries are exceptional. They're toroidal manifolds. Their fundamental groups can be left ordered using technology developed for left ordering amalgamated free products along a z squared. The integer slopes can be handled in two distinct ways. First, these manifolds carry taut foliations, and so Thurston constructs an action of pi1 on a circle. One can check that the Euler class of these foliations vanishes, so these actions can be lifted to actions on R. Second, these manifolds have some special foliations arising as the stable foliations of Anasa flows. These flows were studied by Fenley in the 90s, and the foliations are R-covered, meaning that the least spaces are homeomorphic to R. And as we discussed earlier, that gives rise to a left ordering. What we do today will be a generalization in some sense of Fenley's picture, but our generalization will be equipped to deal with non-R-covered foliations. So we'll be able to extend our techniques from anosal flows to pseudo-anosal flows, and we'll be able to left order every rational surgery on the figure eight knot. Now, I don't want to give the impression that the methods I'll show you today subsume all previous methods. Of course, there are certainly cases where the previous methods succeed and today's don't. For example, surgeries on L-space knots. But the method is interesting because it directly uses the geometry of the foliation and often left orders complete Dane surgery intervals. All right, let's move on to review the definitions of top foliations. A foliation is a decomposition of a three manifold into surfaces called leaves this decomposition is locally modeled on R2 cross R. I'll also draw some foliations in dimension 2, and I'll always mean a co-dimension 1 foliation. The foliations today are all co-oriented, meaning that it makes sense to say that arcs in the 3 manifold are positively or negatively transverse to the foliation. A foliation is called taut if through every point in the 3 manifold there is a closed loop transverse to the foliation. Here are some examples of taut foliations. A fibered manifold is always taut. A second example that will be relevant later today is a NOS of suspension, which is a certain foliation on a T2 bundle over S1. To specify such an example, we need a map phi from T2 to T2 that is hyperbolic. Now, foliate T2 by one of the eigendirections of phi and take a product with an interval. Now we foliated T2 cross I, and finally glue the front to the back, the front copy of T2 to the back copy of T2 by phi. Since phi preserves the foliation on T2, the foliation glues up to a foliation on the closed three manifold. This is foliation is taut because through every point in the foliation, I can find a closed loop transverse to the foliation. A canonical example of a foliation which is not taut is a foliation which includes a rib component, which I've drawn on the right. Taut foliations enjoy many good properties. The main ones we'll use today are first, the fact that loops transverse to a taut foliation are not contractible. Second, the leaves of a taut foliation are pi-1 injective, and they lift to properly embedded planes in the universal cover of M, which is forced to be R3. Here, you need to omit some special case, S1 cross S2. Okay, we've defined left orderability and taut foliations, and now I'd like to make a preliminary connection between them. The vague idea is that they both have something to do with positivity of loops 
in pi 1 of n. So given a taut foliation, let's try to construct a left order of pi 1. We need to assign elements of pi 1 to either the positive or the negative cone, and one natural thing to try is to assign loops which are positively transverse to f to be in the positive cone, and loops which are negatively transverse to f to be in the negative cone. You can concatenate two loops positively transverse to the foliation, so p times p is a subset of p, and similarly n times n is a subset of n, so we're good so far. Now it turns out that if f is taut, that implies that p, n, and the singleton containing the identity are disjoint. Remember that tautness of f implies that loops transverse to the foliation are not contractible, so that implies that p is disjoint from the singleton containing the identity, and n is also disjoint from the singleton containing the identity. p is also disjoint from n for similar reasons. Suppose gamma is in p, and gamma is in n. That implies that gamma inverse is in p. So gamma, gamma inverse is in p. But this contradicts tautness again. So p and n are disjoint cones, but unfortunately they don't cover all of the fundamental group. There are loops which can't be homotope to be transverse to the foliation. The reason for this is branching in the leaf space of the foliation. Let's explore this branching phenomenon in some more detail. Here's a foliation of an annulus called a rabe foliation. I'm going to fatten it up a little bit and add on some colors on each boundary component foliated as a product. Let's compute the leaf space of this foliation. First, the lift of this foliation to the universal cover looks like this. So observe that there's a one-parameter family, these blue leaves, which bifurcates into two families of leaves, the two black families. So the leaf space looks like a tree with two branches. One thing to note is that there are two leaves, these red leaves, whose images in the leaf space aren't separable. So actually this red point is two different red points. For today, we don't lose too much by taking the maximal Hausdorff quotient, so we'll think of both of these leaves as corresponding with the same red point in the leaf space. I'll call this point a branch point. Here's an analogous example one dimension up. This is a foliation of a solid torus known as a stack of saddles or a stack of chairs. Here I've drawn everything with the S1 factor cut open and drawn vertically. You start with the standard foliation d2 times s1, and alternately comb up and down the leaves on four sides. In the limit where you've combed down the leaves infinitely far, you can compactify by adding four leaves on the boundary, which are topologically annuli. Two of them are oriented inwards, and two of them are oriented outwards. Really, you should think of this as a foliation of an ideal foregone times S1. This picture generalizes the rape foliation in two dimensions. If I take a longitudinal slice in this direction, I see a rape foliation. If instead I take a slice in the perpendicular direction, I see another rape foliation. this time with leaves opening up instead of down. Finally, if you take a slice intersecting an adjacent pair of boundary faces, you see a foliation like this. Let's compute the leaf space of this example. First, we implicitly lift to the universal cover, and we'll label the four leaves on the boundary A, B, C, and D. As before, we'll think of each of these four leaves to a product region. There's a one-parameter family of saddle leaves on the interior, which corresponds to an interval in the leaf space. This family bifurcates in the positive direction into families B and D. 
and in the negative direction into A and C. So the leaf space has two branch points, each with two branches coming out. In this example, we foliated an ideal quadrilateral times S1, but you could easily generalize this to a foliation of an ideal 2n gon times S1 using a stack of monkey saddles inside of saddles. As a further generalization, you can add some monodromy so that the top of the picture glues to the bottom of the picture with a rotation, a rotation with an even number of clicks. This lets us foliate an arbitrary ideal 2n gon bundle over S1. The resulting leaf space looks very similar. It has n branches coming out of the top and n branches coming out the bottom. Let's now see how to use monkey saddles to foliate surgeries on the figure 8 knot. We'll denote the p over q surgery on the figure 8 by m sub p over q, and k will mean the Dane surgery core in mp over q. Now the zero surgery is a t2 bundle over s1 because the figure 8 knot has units 1, and the monodromy of the figure 8 knot is hyperbolic. So m sub 0 carries a foliation as an anosyl suspension, as we discussed earlier. Something special about anosyl foliations is that all leaves are either cylinders or planes. The fact that we'll need to construct foliations on surgeries on the figure 8 knot is that the Dane surgery core in M0 lies inside a cylindrical leaf, and it wraps around the leaf exactly once. To construct a top foliation on MP over Q, we start with this anosyl suspension foliation on M0, and we'll double the leaf containing the Dane surgery core and puff some air in. Let me draw a picture of that. So here's the leaf lambda. containing the Dane surgery core. Lambda is cylindrical. And here's the Dane surgery core. We puff some air in after doubling lambda, and we get a picture like this. Now to be precise, I'm not only puffing in air into a compact region, I'm puffing in air all the way along the leaf lambda. Since lambda is cylindrical, this is okay. This operation is called a Donjua split. Finally, let's do P over Q surgery on this manifold M0. So let me draw in blue the new meridian. The meridian intersects the cusps four times. So in the surgered manifold, this blue curve bounds an ideal quadrilateral. Now the exterior of this region is foliated by the anosyl foliation, and the interior can be foliated using a stack of monkey saddles. You can see that this construction works for any P over Q surgery, we'll just have a different number of sides for this ideal polygon, as long as the blue curve, which represents the meridian, is not parallel to the cusps, meaning vertical in this picture. So now we have a closed manifold that contains some monkey saddles inside it, and a proposition that you can prove in this case is that the only branching in the leaf space of this foliation occurs at the lifts of the monkey saddle region. I'm now ready to state the main theorem, which applies to a class of examples generalizing the foliations we just constructed on surgeries on the figure 8 knot. Let phi be a pseudo -nos of automorphism of a surface of genus G, and assume that the stable foliations of phi are orientable and furthermore that the orientation is preserved by phi. Now, phi induces a flow on the mapping torus of phi. So let k1 to kn be any collections of closed orbits of that suspension flow. Let m be the result of surgery along the ki's with any slopes all of the same sign. I won't explain the sign convention precisely, but if the word degeneracy slope means something to you, then we use the fiber slope and the degeneracy slope to define positivity. Let f be a foliation constructed via a generalization of the construction I just showed on the figure eight knot surgeries. The main theorem says that there's a way to crush down the leaf space of f to a real line 
such that the action of pi 1 descends. The action on r is non-trivial, so this shows that pi 1 of m is left orderable. Let me now try to survey this strategy of proof. As an analogy, let's think of the least space as an infinite rooted binary tree. We want to crush this tree down to a copy of R. Our strategy is that at each branch point, we're going to choose a path to infinity through each emanating branch and glue these paths together. So, for example, at this point, I'll choose a blue path to infinity and a red path to infinity. Similarly, at this point, I'll choose a blue path to infinity and a red path to infinity. Now, at each branch point, I'll glue blue to red. You can see that after I've glued a pair of paths at each branch point, the quotient manifold is R. The first complication arises is that we would like all the gluings that we perform to be pi 1 echo variant, so that the action of pi 1 on the least space L descends to an action on the quotient R. In particular, if x and y are two points that get identified by our gluing operation, then for every group element G, gx should be glued to gy. Now for most group elements g, this doesn't present a huge problem because at different branch points, we can just perform conjugate gluings. The difficulty arises when a group element g fixes a given branch point. Fortunately for us, there are often not that many group elements g that fix a given branch point. Here's the theorem of Kano. Suppose f is a co-orientable taut foliation on an atoroidal 3 manifold. If b is a branch point with finite branching, meaning that there are a finite number of paths coming out of it, then the stabilizer of b is either trivial or a copy of z. Now making our choices z equivariant is not so difficult. Let me try to make this a bit more concrete in the case of surgeries on the figure 8 knot. In this case, as we stated earlier, all branch points in the leaf space are associated with branching at the monkey saddle region. It turns out that the stabilizer of the branch point at the monkey saddle region is just the element of pi 1 representing the Dane surgery core. It's not too hard to make all the gluing choices commute with this one element of pi 1. Let's move on to a second complication, which is more serious. Sometimes, even after gluing at each branch point, the quotient manifold is not R. It might still be a tree. Essentially, this is because paths which are properly embedded in the leaf space and go off to infinity may fail to be properly embedded in the quotient. Here's a concrete example of what could go wrong. Again, in our toy example of an infinite binary tree. Previously, we glued the blue path that goes left, 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 left to the red path that goes right, 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 right by an isometry. But let's try a slightly different gluing. Let's glue the path left, right, 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 right to infinity, to the path right, left, right, 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 off to infinity. We'll do the gluing in a slightly funny way. It won't preserve the levels of the binary tree. We glue so that this first leg of the red path gets glued to the first two legs of the second path. The remaining right, 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 right paths are just glued in the obvious way. So most points on the left are glued to points on the right that are on a lower level of the binary tree. Of course, we do the conjugate gluing at every other branch point. 
Now, it turns out that the quotient is not a line, but a tree with still infinite branching. To visualize this, I'll draw some equivalence classes of points with respect to this gluing relation on a second binary tree. The equivalence class 1 is a parent of a countable infinity of different equivalence classes, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Moreover, these other equivalence classes are pairwise not comparable in the partial order given by the tree. This phenomenon is the main difficulty encountered in gluing leaf spaces of foliations, but under suitable hypotheses, we can further collapse this tree down to a copy of R. I won't give more specifics about the proof because it'll involve a bit more setup, but I hope this gives a flavor of the kinds of issues that we encounter. The examples we've explored today motivate the following definition. A foliation F on M is compatible with an action of pi 1 on R if there is an open, order-preserving pi 1 equivariant map from the leaf space to R. So the picture you should have in mind is that the universal cover of M is getting squashed down to R. The pre-image of a point in R is a discrete collection of leaves in the universal cover. The problem I've been trying to interest you in today is to find more examples of compatible pairs. I'll end with a bit of eye candy showing off an example of a foliation compatible with a PSL2R tilde representation. The picture I'll show you is the picture I've drawn on the left, the universal cover of M. However, it will be straightened out into the Poincaré disk model. So the leaves, this discrete collection of leaves that you see here, which appear flat in this picture, will become very wrinkled and distorted.